So, sum up. Climate change. Silence. People not talking about it. There is a socially constructed silence. There's a way that people collectively choose not to talk about it. A little bit of brain psychology. We know that there are two processes in the brain. We know that information and data is one process. That's the more intelligent side of what we do. That's the more advanced, more recent development to our brains. And there's an underlying brain as well, which is what psychologists would call affective reasoning. And that doesn't respond to those things. It responds to what's here, now, things we've experienced, so it draws on recent experience, the social cues we receive from the people around us, what the people around us seem to be thinking or doing. And it also deals in the realm of meta metaphor and narrative. Now, these are not separate parts of a brain. They're deeply interlinked, but they process information separately and they're in total communication. And I'm drawing here on hundreds of years of research, but also most recently from brain scanning, which shows exactly how these mechanisms work. We have a problem with climate change, because the scientific data comes in on this side. We depend in our, on our trust on the science. The problem is that a bit like our supplements in our, in our magazine, in our newspapers, Climate change can sit permanently over in that corner. We are capable of holding an intellectual knowledge of something indefinitely without it affecting our true beliefs and behaviors. Because in order for it to do so, it has to cross over here. And this side is where we get the action. This is the dominant side, and this is where we recognize threat. That is why, and I'm convinced of this, because I spend a lot of my time talking with climate scientists who are, have, in my view, as a kind of defense mechanism, become extremely adept at keeping it over there that anyone, even the most intelligent people, are capable of keeping something as an abstract to avoid it coming over here. We therefore have to bring it over here. And I spoke of a lot of people who are experts in their fields who said consistently the same thing, but we have to engage affective reasoning. One of the people I spoke to was a man called Daniel Kahneman, who's an exceptional man. It was a great thrill to meet him. Professor Kahneman is a Nobel laureate in, in uh, won the Nobel Prize for his work on the biases, the way that cognitive biases affect what we pay attention to or don't pay attention to. I'm back on that theme again. He found, say, three things. One thing he found is that we are, not, we are loss averse. We do not like dealing with things which involve losses. He also said, we're very bad at dealing with things in the future through a process he calls temp hyperbolic temporal discounting. Issues that are further away in the future become more and more remote. And far in the future, we can be fine about them. We can, we can postpone things indefinitely far into the future, but doing things now, things that, that are now have far, far more attention for us. Finally, he said uncertainty. Uncertainty is a real issue for us, but uncertainty we seek in our brains to make things complete, and if they're not, we try uh, we, we, we can't engage with them. And he says, well, he was a very sweet man. He's a very nice man. He said, I'm so sorry, he said. I said, that's fine. That's fine, uh, Professor Carl. It's nice to meet you. He said, no, 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 I'm so sorry. He said, I'm so sorry. He said, I see no hope. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, okay, okay, yeah, okay. I, I accept your apology. I, I, <laughs> thanks. And now I'm spreading it, you know. I, on behalf of Professor Carl, I'm so sorry. Um, he says, because it combines, it's a perfect combination of all of the things that for the past 50 years he's been studying. And it gets them all together. It is something in the future, it is uncertain, it involves us to make certain sacrifices now in the interest of avoiding larger and uncertain sacrifices in the future. All of his research shows that this is a horrible combination. But I'm not so sure. I'm sure he's right. I mean, there's no question. I mean, he's right. But I'm not so sure that climate change is those things. I think that's how we've written the story of climate change. And this is my second theme. I think we've made climate change those things precisely because we know that they don't work well against the things that we're bad at. We have designed it to work like that. That's why the vast majority of people will say, but climate change is a problem, a really big problem in the future. In fact, strangely, when you look at the statistics, more people say that climate change will be a big problem in the future than apparently even believe that climate change exists, which in itself <laughs> is interesting, is it not? 
So why do we ignore climate change? That's, I guess, a, the theme of my thing. Well, let's say what it's not. I don't think we ignore climate change because it's in the future, it's expensive, it's uncertain, or it requires sacrifice. One reason for that is because I look out at the world of people who are very doubtful about climate change, including many people who are conservatives in their politics, and they are quite prepared to tolerate things that are expensive, uncertain, require sacrifice when it combines well with their values. Mitt Romney, for example, who was running for the president, of course, against Barack Obama, the presidential campaign. He was quite openly uh, skeptical of climate change. Yeah, I think he's skeptical, he's generous. He was quite open saying he didn't think it was a problem. At the same time, he said uncertainty should be no obstacle for our investment in, in the war against terrorism. Nor apparently should, is, the, is, the issue of, uh, is the issue of costs, nor has it been for a number of, uh, you know, we, we both in, in my own country, in Britain and America, have spent huge amounts of money on, uh, the, uh, on protection against terrorism, against extremely uncertain risks. I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong, I'm just pointing out, extremely uncertain. Major sacrifice and major cost. When it comes to wars, of course, there's no limit to the sacrifice we'll take. 100 years on from the anniversary of the First World War, entire generation of people in my country massacred. For, for what exactly? In fact, it is clear as humans we're highly cooperative and we can do sacrifices if it combines with our values to do that. Nor, I have to say, do I think it's because the information is corrupted. You know, I went and spoke with Michael Mann, James Hansen, who's leading climate scientists. I said, why do you think we don't get climate change? And they said, it's the information. They said, the information has been polluted by these professional climate change deniers who are paid off by oil companies. I said, yeah, but I have more of a feeling, and again, there's a lot of research to support this, but what actually happens is they're just simply providing information for people who don't want to believe in climate change in the first place. In other words, it's not that they're polluting the, 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 the information, but they're providing the stories that the people who don't want to accept it are all too keen to take on board. And it's very interesting, you know, that people who, people who do not accept climate change as a group tend to be slightly better scientifically educated than people do not. If you do, them, if you do a general science knowledge test for them, these are not stupid people. These are people who are well educated and often know a lot about science. So there's something going on here which is more complex. But I'm not saying these things aren't important. They clearly are very important. So this is my, my premise, that climate change exists for us primarily in the form of social values, not scientific values, social values. And these are constructed narratives and storylines, and they're based on our values and our worldview. And the problem with climate change is climate change is exceptionally open to the formation of these. It is wide open. It can be interpreted in many, many different ways than people do. It is, has none of a, it's not so much it's uncertain, but it has none of a kind of specificity of other issues. And sure, we find it hard to accept. We find all kinds of challenge and threat hard to accept. But in this case, we can generate the narrative around it that enables us to do what we want with it. For people like myself, who are deeply concerned about the environment and like the idea of maybe rechanging society, it sounds great. I'm quite prepared to shape it in my own image and make it that, as indeed lots of people do. It enables people to ignore it or to reject it according to however they wish to engage with it. And so what you end up with is this, is this kind of tableau of competing narratives of different people shaping it in different ways. Now, I said before, and uh, you know, Professor Kahneman was saying this too, but, but, but the human mind hates uncertainty. It hates... Uh, it, uh, rejects, um, it, it, it rejects incomplete things, and it seeks to make completeness. It seeks to categorize and put things into intersections. I got a toy last, about a month or two ago. But my, my son, who's 10 years old, and you'll see why 10-year-olds love this kind of thing, was kind of, we had a lot of fun with this. It's one of these, you see? I'm not sure that this does a lot for my respect. I mean, there's a, <laughs> but, and of course, you're looking at this and it's great, isn't it? It's really fun. The thing which makes this work is that, and what I like about it is the thing which makes it work and puts in the missing bit is the bit in between the two bits. It's our brain. Our brain sees that. It seeks to create a, a whole out of different parts. It fills in the gaps and it puts the two things together. 
This is what the Berlin School, what, about 1920, called the Gestalt of Completeness. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of classic optical illusion. This is what we do with storylines and bits of climate change that are missing. What is particularly compelling about this, why when we look at this we're so drawn to it, is because it raises a very interesting question too. This isn't just a thing which is through my head. This is an arrow. That is a, a, a narrative of, of, of violence. And it immediately raises the issue that somebody has caused me harm with the intention of hurting me. It raises the issue of who did it, are they our enemy, and why did they do it? And that's why this is such a good illusion. That is why climate change, in some ways, is, in my, is, is such, <laughs> we could say, a headache. Because climate change is like that. Climate change has this missing bit. We know the causes and we know the effects, but this big question of causality and responsibility of who does it is that bit which is missing in the middle. And of course, as I said, our brains fill it in. But because it's a flexible, flippy, floppy narrative, like a jelly, a jelly mold issue, but we pour into the molds of our own values, we put in the enemy that seems to fit. And kind of as proof of that, we could say, we could say imagine a different kind of, of uh, climate change. Imagine that uh, drones flying over North Korea, for example, saw this. This, we know, is North Korea deliberately putting gases into the atmosphere that will destroy the world's climate. They're called greenhouse gases. I'm sorry to break this news to you. They're called greenhouse gases. They're extremely dangerous. They're going to destabilize the world's climate. And here is proof that North Korea is doing this. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, right now. Photograph taken by our drones last week. What's more? Look, we even have, we even have poster evidence. There they are. A secret report smuggled out of North Korea by somebody who managed to tunnel under the border. He had it gripped between his teeth. It bore the signature of Kim Jong-un himself, saying that not only were they intending to do this, but they knew when they did so that they would take on, they, that it would destroy wheat and grain production across the entire American Midwest. And of course, if we knew that North Korea had the intention of destroying the world's climate and was doing so in order to destroy American grain production, which is unfortunately one of the side effects of over four degrees of climate change, as I talk about in the book, um, I think we'd have no problems dealing with this, actually. I think it's be a pretty straightforward issue. Um, I'm afraid I have to say, I think that the biggest argument between the left and right wings would be about who was going to move fastest on it. And, it, you know, it would be kind of ugly. But we would be mobilized, there'd be no question. Climate change, however, does not have an intention to cause harm. It does not even have a clear enemy. In fact, we are the enemy. All of, I'm sorry. We, we're all the enemy. We're all causing it. In fact, even the word enemy doesn't stick. I don't consider myself an enemy because I have no intention to cause harm. I came here. I flew over here. I'm making flights here with the intention of actually spreading a book on climate change. When I'm not doing this, maybe I'm flying to see my sick sister. Maybe, uh, maybe, I'm, uh, maybe I'm just driving the kids to school. Maybe I'm just trying to heat my, my house. I'm just eating food. I mean, I'm just doing all of those things. There's no intention to cause harm. So when we go out with climate change and we say, climate change, this is a huge issue. And we've got to change the way we live. Of course, not surprisingly, people back off because with a moral challenge like that, there's a lot of blame. And with the blame, nobody wants the blame if they do not have the intention. Why would they? They're just trying to live their lives. 